Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Source Track at Apache Con at Home 2020. Uh, for this session, we have with us Cassandra Target, uh, a longtime Lucene community member, PMC member, and a committer. Uh, she's here to talk about open source docs as code and will be sharing with us uh, Lucene community's experience maintaining sort of documentation in the same way as we maintain code. Um, as one of the key contributors and the driver uh, of this evolution, she will walk through the evolution uh, of this process and how other projects can make updating documentation a natural part of the code change process. Okay, <laughs> so I feel like I'm flying really blind uh, at the moment since I can't uh, hear anybody or see my own slides or anything. So uh, here goes, please in the chat, let me know if I drop out um, or you can't see slides or whatever. Uh, but uh, as Antrim uh, explained, we're going to talk a little bit about um, docs as code as a concept for uh, open source projects. Um, to get started, I'm Cassandra Target. I know Antrim introduced me. I'm on the Lucene PMC. Um, I'm going to have my contact info at the end as well. Um, my day, during my day job, I'm director of engineering at uh, LucidWorks. Um, so, uh, all right. So, what does uh, we're going to talk about today? We're going to talk about um, what is Docs of Code? What is it? Um, a bit about the evolution of Solar's documentation, where we started and kind of where we're at now. Uh, the tools and the workflow that we use, and then talk a little bit about if it's right uh, for you uh, or if you and your project. So, what does Docs as Code mean? Basically, it means to treat documentation the same with the same principles as code, right? So, your documentation files are stored in your project source repository. Your build tools generate docs for publication. Edits are treated the same way as code changes. Um, generally, you know, basically you treat document, you know, treat documentation as though it was code. And, and in a sense, you know, that makes a lot of workflow situations easier. Um, so, uh, some, I've seen some projects store their documentation files in a separate repository that kind of violates a bit of the philosophy because the main point is to kind of keep, keep everything for your project in one spot. Um, but it, I've, I've also seen it, seen it kind of work. When you do this, there's kind of an implicit assumption here that uh, your, your documentation files are really just in a simple text format. And um, you know, you're not actually generating massive PDFs and storing your documentation and saying we're doing docs as code. Um, you know, the, basically the raw content files are what you're storing and you're treating them the same as you treat your classes, you know, uh, your JavaScript, like any, any other pieces of code uh, that you use. And integrating with your existing tools is also key. Storing it in one place is, is you know, storing it all in the same place is fine, but um, you know, if you're not using the same kind of tools, you're really not treating that documentation as code. So we know, I, I think lots of folks have seen this survey before, this is from 2017 um, of opensourcesurvey.org. Um, you know, 93% of the respondents said that incomplete or confusing documentation is a, is a problem in open source projects. As members of open source projects, we know kind of some reasons why that, you know, why that can happen. Um, and, you know, the, the reasons are often complex, but ultimately, and it happens to me all the time, this boils down to time. You know, how much time are you able to, are, are you as a project able to spend on documentation? Um, obviously, there's other obstacles, uh, such as maybe not understanding what users need, maybe the application is too complex and needs some ease of use. Um, and, you know, you may also, in a global, diverse community, may have some percentage of your community that doesn't feel comfortable writing in uh, the, the primary language of the documentation, and they need some assistance. And for all of these things, Stops as Code can really help, because the more you remove the barriers to, uh, to editing documentation and working with documentation, the easier it is to spend time on some of these other issues, like making sure all your updates are done before you do a release, helping out other members, helping them with copy editing, or just giving them a thumbs up that their documentation is, is fine. Um, 
So I'll get back into uh, some of these some of these reasons uh, at the end, but we'll, let's start talking about the Solar Reference Guide. Um, so uh, the Solar Reference Guide is is published by the Apache Lucene community. The uh, Apache Lucene obviously publishes Apache Lucene. It also is responsible for Apache Solar. Um, we are going to be probably moving to a top level project. Solar is going to be moving into a top level project soon, uh, but for now we're kind of all together. Um, so the Solar Reference Guide is the comprehensive guide to everything about solar. Um, we're up to 245 pages. This is individual documentation files. It's uh, which is a lot. Um, it's actually pretty big. <laughs> um, it's version for every minor release. So if we do like a bug fix release, like 8.6.3, like we're not going to re release the documentation. But 8.5 and 8.6 and 8.7, there's a whole new version of the guide. It's a mix of tutorial, reference, how tos. Um, needs more of the how-to and more of the tutorial, but uh, it's it's getting there. Um, so, uh, all right. So, how did we get to the solar reference guide as it exists today? Um, the original docs from the beginning of time with solar uh, were in the old Moin Moin wiki, the old wiki, um, and it was it was actually it was okay. I mean, it was good, you know, actually for for documentation maintained in a wiki, it's better than others um, that I've seen. But it, um, but it was kind of a little bit of a mishmash of versions in, in the same page, right? So when you first look at this page before you start trying to read it, you, you see these kind of, you know, like warning triangles that say, oh, this section's only for this version. But it doesn't really, it's not totally clear how, um, it, you know, which parts of the page are only for the specific version. Um, the developers, you know, the, our community relies pretty heavily on developers editing documentation. Um, and the developers pretty, did a reasonably good job keeping it up to date, partially because they didn't really need to worry about versioning it, right? Like they could just update it whenever and say, oh yeah, and in 3.2 I added this feature, even if it was 3.5 please. Um, so in uh, 2010, uh, Lucidworks, my company, um, started, uh, produced this thing called the Solar Reference Guide. And it, they hired some technical writers to, to write it, like professional people, and um, released it as a PDF that you had to give your email address to to marketing to, in order to get. Um, in uh, um, a, shortly after that, in some period of time, we realized it wasn't the best marketing tool that we ever came up with. So we actually put it on our in, a, in Confluence, actually in the Confluence that the company hosted, and made it available that way. Um, so the community was still maintaining the wiki documentation, and LucidWorks was maintaining this kind of parallel documentation. So in 2013, we um, moved, we actually, the company donated it to the ASF, and the community agreed to take it on as the official documentation. Uh, so it moved actually from the LucidWorks confluence into the Apache confluence. It was pretty much pretty straight uh, migration. Um, this actually worked pretty well. It was, you know, kind of parity with what was there. And it was made, you know, ostensibly maintained by the community. Uh, but there are some issues with Confluence. There's some issues that, like trying to document a pretty big application with a lot of different files in Confluence. Um, the biggest being that the editing experience was kind of painful. Um, it, it, I actually used Confluence very recently. It's actually a lot better than it was in this time frame, somewhere between 2013 and 2019. Uh, they were transitioning into kind of a new way of editing editing pages, um, and that, pay, that that process was a bit painful. Um, and you know, honestly, developers kind of avoided making changes until the release time. So uh, that because it, and it was a completely different process. There in the code, working with patches, working with at the time it was SVN, uh, you know, working working that way, and then it was move over to Confluence with its painful kind of editing experience and remember how to do that and write it. Um, and, and write, write up what you just changed. Uh, so, you know, it's fair. <laughs> it's fair. Um, but what that kind of turned into is that trying to do a release of a version of the, of the new reference guide for a new release was really manual and took a lot of effort. Um, ultimately, you know, someone would need to manually look at every single JIRA issue that was modified, try to look it up in the ref guide, figure out if documentation had been, documentation changes had been made, keep track of who looked at what and whether they looked at it, whether it needed editing, you know, try to chase down the developer, be, you know, see if he or she had time to help out and see if they had time to do documentation. All of this took forever. Updates were delayed. 
the guide was often released, missing changes, um, and months, weeks to months after the actual release. Um, so it, it just wasn't, it wasn't a great system at all. And, and honestly, there were only a couple people who were taking on the brunt of that work. Um, and, and they weren't, uh, having been one of them, we weren't all that psyched about it. Um, the, uh, and also we couldn't have version specific online docs. Actually, so uh, online, so we only had this PDF, and that was the only version snapshot. So if you went Googling for what, you know, the val possible values for our parameter were, and you end up with the solar reference guide, you might end up looking at documentations for a version much later than the one you're using. And there's no way to kind of get, that, get you there. So uh, I actually, being wise, I mentioned one of the people that did a lot of this, uh, really like chased at all of this, and it was really bothering me. Um, and I had already started hearing about docs as code. Um, so, I, you know, I started thinking about how I could make that work. It seemed like something that would really work for our community because, uh, you know, our developers actually did seem to want to do documentation edits. And they already had in the past with the wiki. Um, they just really probably needed it to be easier and more integrated. So uh, I, I didn't. I knew that I wanted to move to uh, ASCII doc as a format, and I'll talk about why uh, in in a bit. Um, I knew from looking at ASCII doc that the, the project called ASCII Docker that uh, I liked the philosophies behind the tool chain. It was open source. The community was open. Um, it was Ruby based, which is a bit different. Our project's in Java, so I wasn't sure about that part. Um, but essentially, in uh, Labor Day 2015. I made, I started a proof of concept, um, and, uh, just on my own, just to see if I could try to figure out and make it work. Um, I figured out pretty quickly that I was going to need a static site generator for this content, um, because of, uh, navigation and, and some other things that I would want the documentation site to have. Um, so a lot of it was figuring out which documentation, you know, which, sorry, which static site generator to use. And uh, it was about a year actually before I got it into a state that I was ready to make a proposal to the community. And I was really happy that it was really well received. Um, and honestly, though, it still took about a year to get it over the final hurdle. It was May 2017 that we finally uh, finally moved it, moved everything out of Confluence. Um, and we kept our scope pretty, pretty small. Um, there was, uh, you know, everyone had a ton of ideas of stuff we could do. Um, which is always wonderful, except, um, you know, we needed to, to kind of keep it, keep it so that we could get it done. Um, so, you know, basically what we did is we converted the pages to ASCII doc format. We developed, we made the build tooling, uh, the release process. Um, and then we made, we basically just said, let's just have parity with layout and functionality. Anything fancier than that will work on later. So this is what it looks like, actually. And it's just not too different. Um, uh, we got to pick our own colors. Um, as opposed to the last one, which we were stuck kind of with uh, the gen generic ASF one. Um, all of this stuff actually, so this orangish nav bar on the top and this hierarchical thing on the side, this, um, this was all from the, this is all generated by the static site generator Jekyll in our case. This stuff in the middle all comes from, is, all comes from, uh, uh, ASCII Doctor. Um, so what did we actually build? So um, for tooling, you know, and uh, uh, and build kind of stuff, we obviously, you know, once we did this change, changes that needed to happen to docs, they went through, they go through Jira. Um, we have a bit of an unwritten rule that says if it's just like a typo, there's kind of no need for uh, for making a big Jira for, you know, for making a Jira issue for it. Uh, committers can be trusted to just kind of fix those. Um, a project uses Git and GitHub, um, so if you have a pull request, um, if you want to make edits to docs, you can create a pull request as a contributor, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to take a look at it. Um, when we made this transition, we were using um, Ant. And we've since moved to Gradle, which is actually making things a lot easier. Uh, so we actually still have both going on, and we have regular Jenkins jobs that run every time a um, once an hour. The Jenkins jobs look and see if there's any commits, and they build the documentation. So we see, um, you know, on the on the branches we care about, we see where we 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 know if the if the documentation is broken in some way, and the, and it won't build. Um, as I mentioned, we're we are using uh, ASCII Doctor Jekyll and a and a gem that it kind of integrates them. Um, both of those are Ruby projects. So uh, this is a Ruby gem, Jekyll ASCII Doc, that does the HTML conversion. 
right? So I'll show you some ASCII doc files and, and basically we just take those and we turn them into HTML files. Um, we have some Java classes that build the page hierarchy because one of the first things, um, I, I think I was gonna manually maintain the entire page hierarchy in a big like um, JSON file. And uh, uh, um, Haas actually in the community said, you know, that's crazy. Why don't we just, why don't I just build, why don't I just write a Java class that will build it automatically? Um, so we have that. And so that was actually a, you know, simplification uh, that just makes it easier. Um, as long, you know, it builds the hierarchy automatically. No one has to manually maintain anything. Um, we have a, the Solar Project has a, um, a thing called, we call pre-commit. I don't know how many other projects do this. Um, but it's basically validation of code changes because they don't violate some of our rules, you know, kind of sort of a pre-check that it's going to work. Um, that validation actually includes documentation as well. Um, so it checks and makes sure that the, you know, that there weren't changes to documentation that are going to break the build. Um, so that's a, uh, um, um, so that's, that's pretty key too. So in this, we've actually integrated it pretty tightly in each one of these processes that already existed. Um, that already existed for, uh, uh, you know, for building our software, developing our software. Um, on a project level, actually, we've also integrated, in, you know, kind of tightly by um, pulling variables out from the branch that we don't have to maintain inside documentation. So that's the version, right? So the branch knows what version it is. And so the branch just, you know, so the documentation just pulls what version it is out of the branch. The same for dependency versions on outgoing doc links. So, uh, you know, we have a few dependencies that um, users can interact with pretty closely. And, uh, you know, we have documentation in the solar reference guide that links out to those tools, right, so that people can learn more about them. Um, those links are versions. And the versions aren't manually maintained. They come from the branch that we're pulling off of. So the documentation users get sent to is the documentation for the version of the dependency that's for the version of the docs they're reading, okay? Um, our Java doc links also do that. Um, we also have some of the code examples in, um, in the documentation are actually taken from tests um, in the so that are in the source. So um, some of our documentation is actively being tested every time we run the test suite for the software. Um, which is we need to do a ton more of um, and, uh, you know, is pretty, pretty handy and, you know, shows one of the major benefits of integrating these things pretty deeply is that if you have a lot of code examples, you know, keeping them up to date is a bit of a, um, is a bit of a, you know, can be a chore at times. You have to remember to kind of update it manually somewhere. Um, if you pull it, you know, if you, if you're able to just kind of insert them, um, then uh, in, into your, into your, into your documentation, then it's, uh, um, it's much smoother. So as I mentioned, Confluence didn't allow us to host uh, version documents online. So we actually kind of considered the PDF version the official version because it was the only thing that we could make a snapshot of. Um, and even when we switched to this docs as code model, uh, we still considered the HTML, the convenience version. Um, you know, because the PDF is an artifact, that gets downloaded. We, you know, interpreted the ASF policy as meaning like we needed to have a vote on it. We needed to host it on disk.apache.org. We needed to, you know, basically treat it as a release artifact. And um, that, uh, you know, added some, added, you know, added some weight to the release process. Um, so we also actually had two separate converters. We had one that made the HTML and a second that made the PDF. I mean, we could make a, we made an ant target that did both at the same time, but it was still kind of two separate things to maintain. They actually required separate versions of ASCII Doctor. It was kind of that. Um, and there were some things just with the presentation and design of the page that we wanted to be able to do um, that we kind of couldn't do in HTML because we needed to make sure the content would work properly in the PDF, right? And there's obviously like JavaScript things and things that you could do in a page that you can't do in a PDF. And so it, we found ourselves kind of doing some gymnastics. So, um, oh, and the PDF actually, as I said, there's 245 HTML pages. Uh, there were pages to the PDF. Um, and I, there's some content that I know is coming hopefully sometime soon that probably would have taken that up to 2,000 pages, which is pushing the limits of a PDF. 
<laughs> even if you were in love with, even if you really enjoy PDFs. Um, so our workflow today actually is it's a lot simpler. Um, you know, whenever a release manager kind of initiates the code release process, um, we I do a, I actually just do I spend an afternoon kind of comparing commits that I've seen come through on the documentation to the uh, to the JIRAs that have been changed uh, just to see if anything's changed. Um, I mentioned before in Confluence, you know, developers really avoided it. I would say maybe on a good release we would get a quarter to a third of the developers engage, you know, having done the documentation. And easily now this process, I mean, all this process is is me just checking things off a list um, because 90% at least is done already. Um, there's very, very few uh, changes that need to be done. And usually those are just things that I maybe know I are mentioned in the docs and I need to look them up. And maybe I just need to ask somebody a quick question like, are you sure this doesn't need documentation? Um, and, and quite often it's, oh no, I thought of that and I, I decided it didn't. Um, so, you know, the developer engagement in writing, maintaining the documentation has just gone through the roof to the point where someone like me, who's only real contribution to the community is documentation. Um, I, I can start doing other stuff, um, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in a second. Um, the, uh, so once the vote, once the release manager starts to vote for the new release, the, uh, um, I, you know, generally right at that moment, I mean, I'm, we're ready to push, uh, to, we push to our production site our HTML pages for the new ref guide for that version. Um, but they have a draft watermark across them, basically saying this is a draft, it's not done yet because the release isn't out. Um, the minute the release manager pushes the code, you know, the code binaries, the artifacts, the, the release itself, um, the final HTML version that, that removes that draft watermark is pushed. Um, so it's, uh, you know, delayed only based on when I get up and read my email, usually. Um, so uh, we haven't integrated this. This isn't automatic that the release manager does this yet. I'm not sure why we're still not making it automatic. I think it's just me needing to, like, give up the reins. Um, and I think we could do it, actually. Um, so this actually, this process might just be a little bit of a quick check and then let it go. Um, which makes it makes, makes life way, way simpler from what it was. Um, so, um, so HTML kind of layout and customization. Um, so when we started this, like some of the reason why it looks the way it did is that I really had no idea what I was doing. Um, I, you know, I was kind of facing this, like, well, we're going to need to write, you know, if we're going to need to make our own HTML site, like pages. Um, I don't know where really where to start. So I found this thing called the Jekyll documentation thing, theme. Uh, which is by Tom Johnson, um, that uh, did most of what I wanted to do. Um, actually, was that entire original layout you saw. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, Tom Johnson is a technical writer active in kind of docs as code, docs as code uh, 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 advocacy. Um, and, you know, this actually, this is a snippet, actually, of the HTML from Jekyll, which, um, uh, you know, via Jekyll, which is basically the page template for our for documentation page. Um, so in, in 2018, actually, I'd learned a ton more um, and was able to maneuver my way around some of this. And so I actually changed everything. For uh, to, to indicate sections of the page. Um, uh, you know, we actually, in 2020, uh, this year, I've, I launched into a complete redesign of the entire reference guide. Um, and I initially just kind of wanted to upgrade Bootstrap and realized that the theme that we'd inherited, that I had Frankensteined into something, because not knowing what I was doing, had just turned into, had made that really literally impossible. Um, so I needed to kind of re, like, back out a ton of stuff. So I, um, this is the latest design. It's not too different. Um, but, uh, um, it, it's, you know, the, I pulled out a bunch of JavaScript that we're not using. Um, we still have this hierarchical navigation. Um, this, it's actually the page is much more responsive now. Um, and hard to tell from these screenshots, but, uh, actually the old site, we used a very narrow kind of view and it left a lot. If you had a big monitor, left a lot of white space on the screen. And this actually expands to fill your screen. So if you're using a big monitor and there's a big screenshot on it, you're gonna be able to see the whole thing. Um, there's multiple phases of this redesign. Um, so this is phase one was the, the um, look and feel. 
phase two is actually tackling this, um, is going to be tackling this bit massive list of top level sub, uh, topic headings um, that we have. Um, and I'm, I'm, I work on that a little bit uh, whenever I have time in my spare time. Um, so it's not moving that fast, but uh, probably in 2025, I'll be like, well, back in 2019, I started. Uh, but anyway. Um, so, uh, all right. So let's talk a little bit about like sort of that's not where we're at with the ref guide. And let's talk a little bit about um, if you wanted to try to experiment with some of this for, for, for your project. Um, kind of the first thing you need to figure out is what format are the files going to be in. Um, you know, uh, and, and basically I think it really comes down to two choices, Markdown or ASCII doc. Um, and, you know, I said I preferred ASCII doc and I, and I do. And, and the reason why is it, it's a lot more flexible and has support for a lot more types of elements that I want to be able to use. So tables, cross references, footnotes, includes, um, the ASCII doctor tool chain actually, I think is what brings in the includes, but, um, you know, I, I can get it, it ASCII doc was, was designed from the start. It started off as a, as a Python, um, thing, tool, I'm not sure how to rephrase it, um, and was ported to Ruby, but it's, from its start has been designed for writing, right? It's been like, it's for writing. So it's, it's you know, Markdown is the kind of two, it's for very simple writing, but, um, you know, Markdown, sorry, ASCII Doc kind of got a little bit more of the, I'm going to need to publish this someday mindset. Um, the includes thing um, that, uh, um, that I was mentioning is actually something like this, where this is actually the, this is a, a single equal signs is a title of the page. And this is, uh, these are variables. Um, this is a, a, a parameter, but the variable that is being set, which says, you know, I'm going to set this variable called example source directory, which is this path here. And down here, I'm basically, I have what I call, what's called a source block. And I say, I'm going to insert some source code right here. And what this says, it says include this variable and then this path to this test. So this is the example I was saying where we're actually including um, code that's in another section of the repository that gets tested as part of our test suite as our example within the documentation. Um, and so we don't have to actually try to maintain this. This little snippet just says, go get that file. Um, and there's a tag here actually. So it says, go get that, go get this section of that file and put it in here, put it in this source block. Um, so that way we're, we're just maintaining code in one place. We don't have to do it twice. Whatever you choose, ASCII doc or Markdown, and I would absolutely say, if you don't think you're gonna need tables and fancy stuff and you've just got some simple documents, Markdown, I, Markdown's absolutely fine. You don't need to go fancier than it works for your project. But the ultimate goal here is to separate the writing and the publishing, right? So either one of these tools is gonna help, um, is gonna help you quite a bit in, in, uh, in doing that. Um, here's another view, just looking at ASCII doc format in the context of, um, in the context of uh, uh, separating the writing and the publishing, right? So this is just some basic text format. I, I, the author here said I want a tip and then use two equal signs to say a second level, level heading, an H2 basically. Um, and uh, this is actually how we, we our convention for writing parameters. Um, and, you know, the author of this page didn't need to worry about making sure the green, the little green light bulb icon got inserted in the right place and that there's this little horizontal line and it's in a different color. I mean, I, the CSS and the HTML, like, deal with all of that um, entirely. So the author here just needs to say, I want this to be a tip. That's as far as I need to go. What the tip actually looks like is done um, in a more you know in a more centralized way. Um, the uh, uh, let's see uh, right okay okay so uh, Jekyll is a static site generator just to continue talking about tools a little bit um, you know it's uh, it, I think it's okay it works for us for, I mean it's done well for us you know um, phase three of my redesign project. Um, is uh, actually to reconsider other options. The last time I really looked at this was as I like five years ago, and so I would really like to look at other um, um, site generators, um, particularly the folks actually have, are in the process of developing one um, that is explicitly designed for creating documentation. 
Um, and I, I would really like to experiment with that a little bit uh, when I have time. Um, but Jekyll is fine. Um, you know, it's easy to use. It's pretty popular. Lots of people use it. So you find lots of stuff on the internet if you have questions. Um, there's, the templates are reasonably flexible um, and, uh, and pretty, not too hard to figure out. Um, the cons are really that it's designed for blogs. So, uh, you know, for example, um, you can, uh, you know, it, it can handle nested blog posts like in a hierarchy pretty easily. Uh, but you try to do that to your pages and all of a sudden you lose control over like what your URLs are. Um, so, you know, if your site's very simple, Jekyll is a good option. For something that's more complex as ours, um, it's, it's actually kind of causing a little bit of friction. Um, just in their documentation, their CI examples just aren't very diverse, um, you know, because they're in a very like Ruby world. Um, so things like how do you how do you get Jekyll to run in Gradle um, is uh, something we've had to figure out on our own. Um, and anybody who needs to do that is more than welcome to borrow uh, what we've done. <laughs> All right, so to give a, uh, let's see, uh, to show another project example of using ASCII-Doc, just uh, as an example. And they don't use Jekyll. I actually don't know what they use for build. I knew it one time and I've forgotten and I have a feeling I've changed it. Um, this is what HBase has done for their documentation. This is what I believe they call it the HBase book. Um, and no, actually they do have, they have this hierarchy, but this is actually the content. This, all of this stuff is on the same HTML page. Um, so they have, um, so they've decided that their, um, their, their content is split into, into chapters, but it is, you know, they, they can, they, they are going to go with generating it all onto one page. Um, I think that would be too big of an HTML page for solar, um, but it works for them. Um, and that's, uh, and that's great. And I'm showing you this just to kind of show you that, you know, all the fancy hierarchy and navigation and things like that, you don't have to have. Um, obviously, they don't, I mean, I don't know how they're generating this HTML, but they're probably not using much of a static site generator because they don't need page templates. They only need one, right? So, they, and they've got that. Um, so, their, their organization actually is pretty, they're just this organization of the file structure of how they organize it. Um, they've got a CSS file. They've got um, the books.adoc, right? And that's that main book page. And if we were to look in the side of this, what, we're, what we see is just a series of those little include statements that I showed a minute ago. Um, include this file, include this file. And then the directory chapters is, the, is organized into the, chap the different chapters of, of the, the overall book. Um, this is a very simple structure, and this can be adapted by, by lots of projects um, and, uh, you know, in, in whatever way works for you. Um, I did, uh, oh, I did forget one main point actually before when I was talking about Jekyll, which is actually pretty important. Um, I would actually say, you know, with static site generators, if you choose Markdown, you actually have a ton more options for static site generators. And if, if I'm correct, I think that um, Apache CMS system was recently retired and replaced with Pelican, which is a static site generator, which, which supports Markdown. So if you want to go that route, you want to go this route, you actually have a pretty built-in uh, solution available to you right here. Um, I, for the file structure, just thinking about, uh, just showing you kind of what Solar does, uh, this is some of the stuff here, like these first three uh, underscore directories here, data includes layout, um, is, uh, is that all, that's all stuff that has to be there for Jekyll. Um, the templates actually is, is how I introduced HTML5. I actually had to write my own uh, slim template for, uh, or we had to write our own slim templates uh, for, uh, you know, for, for, for basically what the elements are going to be. Uh, but then you notice actually this config YAML file that, that comes from Jekyll too. But then all 245 of our, uh, you know, of our files are, um, of, of our documentation content files are just in a flat file right there. So, uh, so we're, um, you know, so that's, a, um, so, you know, it's, it's starting to get a little annoying scrolling, 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 scrolling all the time. Um, so that's, uh, so that's one, another reason why I want to look at different static site generators. Um, but as I, as I said, there are, um, there's a dozen of them. The world has moved on since the last time I really looked at it. Uh, Pelican, I think we, you know, as a, as replacement for CMS, I think we have had good experiences with. Um, I found JBake really easy as well. That again, five years ago, Jekyll is easy. Um, and there's, and there's, there's others depending on your needs for your project. 
So, you know, kind of going back to, you know, having gone through kind of all this, if we were to kind of think about like what some of what I would, I would say some of the benefits of, of docs as code are, um, the primary one really is to just make documentation an integral part of your project. The deeper that you can get it integrated, you know, um, into, into the day to day activities, the easier it's going to be for everybody to participate in, um, update, updating that. Um, the, uh, you know, when we migrated from, when, as we're migrating from AMP into Gradle, you know, I haven't had to ask for help or beg for someone to pay attention to documentation, you know, in terms of tooling, it's there in AMP, it's going to be there in Gradle. Um, and so, you know, the project just makes a commitment that this is important to. Um, if you can simplify that documentation change and review process, um, it, you know, your benefits are going, are going to, to increase, right? The faster the changes can get in, uh, the better engaged contributors are going to be by suggesting improvements and, um, and, uh, you know, the, be the better developers are going to be able to like understand that it's pretty easy to just make a change and, and do it and, and continue to do that. Um, Working, you work with tools, you get to work with tools you're already using, which actually, you know, reduces the amount of context switching that you need to do in a day on the project. Um, you would have complete flexibility in publication process, release schedule, all of that, and presentation. So you want it to look a certain way, you can make it look that way. Um, and I think you also have the ability to diversify your contributor skill set. You know, um, you can have contributors like making commit who don't are, you know, who aren't writing code, um, which is, you know, which is me. I've never written a line of code in Solar ever. And I believe I'm in the top 10 of, of contributors um, just from writing documentation. Um, and that, you know, as a perspective that kind of helps the community kind of look beyond uh, known, uh, <clears throat> known, known avenues of contribution. So just running out of a little time, I don't want to um, go to, I don't want to try, I don't want to go over, but, um, uh, you know, so can it work for you? Um, if you want separation of writing and presentation, um, I think, you know, it can. Um, if you like, if you've been writing your documentation at Confluence and you've got no problems with it and it's working fine for you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you are chafing against some of the, the things and you'd like something a little bit simpler, th this is, this is kind of, this is an approach that you can think about. Um, if you have a cultural enthusiasm, just generally amongst your, your developers, contributor, your developer and contributor community, um, you know, this, I think this, this is the type of thing that makes it, you know, but reduces the barriers to entry and might, uh, you know, would increase the, the participation. Um, if you can customize the publication process for your workflow, so if you actually have the ability to, you know, customize your, uh, build processes and things like that, you know, like the technical skills to do that. Um, and same as for the, um, oops, sorry, same as for the, yeah, the HTML and CSS changes um, would, uh, um, you know, uh, you need to be able to do both those things. If you are, then this, this is something that can work for you. Um, if you're in an environment where, like, maybe your tooling is just not flexible for this, and I had a hard time thinking about, like, how that could happen, but it might. Um, if, you know, if you're like, oh, we need to redesign our entire build system, like maybe this isn't an option for you, maybe something else is. Um, if you have, and I wrote cultural resistance and I, as I, as I was practicing, I kept saying like, I don't really mean like, you know, I think no one says like documentation is bad or wrong or whatever, but I think sometimes people, you may have actually a, uh, uh, you know, your application or whatever it is you're building may actually have great job adopt. And maybe it's a library that people are integrating and really all they need is Javadoc. Maybe you don't need this. Like maybe it's not, you know, just because it's possible doesn't mean you have to have it. Um, maybe you may, maybe your attention improving Javadoc or publishing Javadoc is time better spent. Um, if you have contributors with a strong technical writing background who actually know like all of the official tools that tech writers write and they're willing to use them and maintain them and all that stuff, then, you know, then may not, this may feel too simple for them. Um, and uh, may may not they may not enjoy it, um, or if you have collaborators and you know who just who can't who aren't technical enough to learn some of the tools of you know um, learn the build and Jenkins and setting up Jenkins jobs and learning Git you know Git and GitHub and publication and HTML and CSS. Um, if that's uh, um, if that's something that's that's not available to you, then this this may not work either. And 
honestly, I think if you just had one of these, it still could probably work. If you had a combination of these items, I think it would still be, it, it could be a challenge for you. So that's it. Um, so I'm actually pretty close to done with time. Um, so thank you everybody. Um, if uh, you have, if you, if you're on a project that um, is thinking about, would you, if you'd like to talk to me more about this, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you're on a project that would like to go forward, I can point you at all the stuff and um, all the stuff we've done and, uh, and, and the code we've written and you'd be welcome, obviously more than welcome to, uh, to borrow any of it. Um, so, uh, so thank you everybody.